not going to hurt my feelings. Hi, everyone. Erin and I were just chatting and giggling because she's just said, ask me hard questions. Ask me weird questions. So um, there's your there's your permission, guys. Ask. <laughs> um, welcome to this session on modern mending. Somebody said right at the top, I'm really intrigued, but I'm not sure what, what this session will be about. So we're going to get Erin to explain the term modern mending. <laughs> Um, Erin and I have known each other online for some time, haven't we? That's a technical term. Um, mm. Four years, maybe? Yeah, and we, we've even met in real life, haven't we, when Erin came over, because Erin's in Australia, but they came over for a UK tour. Oh, it was, a, was it a European tour? I'm not sure. Um, and uh, yeah, we, we met up, so that was really lovely. But uh, yeah, I have to say, Erin, uh, I have a bit of a girl crush on Erin. She's one of my favorite people. Um, she always looks so stylish, look at her. I'm here in my jumper and she's got her headscarf and things on. Erin, um, uh, introduce yourselves to us. Hi, I'm Erin. Uh, I have an American accent. It's not a trick. You're not going crazy. Um, I'm originally from California and I have been living in Melbourne, Australia for 19 years now, I think. Um, I'm legally Australian as well, but it is confusing, I know. Um, I mainly had a career as a journalist for a long time and quit that in 2012 and went on this very strange career path that has somehow ended up with me being a professional clothes mender. Um, a clothes mending instructor, and now I run an online shop that sells mending supplies, and I spend most of my days packing orders and doing customer service. So I'm, it's kind of like all the different um, possible ways to mend. Oh, and also uh, mending commissions. So people pay me to mend their clothes as well. And and you wrote a book. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I wrote a book. Hi. Yeah, I did. Um, and when did the book come out? February. So I slid in one month before coronavirus went crazy. It was like I could not have scripted that timing better if I wanted to. And it feels weird to take advantage of it. But like it's it, yeah, other people who've had books come out even like in March, it's just been, you know, and like you just slid in too, Jen. So mm, yeah, 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 yeah. Very strange timing, but yeah, yeah. Um, so you've you, you've given us such a potted um, version of kind of your even the past few years since I've known you. Um, talk to us about Bright Sparks because that was a really interesting adventure as well. <laughs> that was a you really good thing to call it. Yeah. yeah, it was an adventure. Um, so uh, just to give you a little more backstory, in 2012. That was when I officially quit journalism. And then three months later, I was diagnosed with cancer. And I'm fine. My husband says I have to say that really quickly. Otherwise, people freak out. I'm fine. Uh, but I went through this whole period of what am I doing with my life? What is my special purpose? What am I? I don't want to do that thing anymore that I did for nearly 20 years, but I don't know what I want to do. So I started on a series of projects really I wasn't like I actually went to a career counselor and paid a lot of money and she said there's no one job for you like <laughs> we can't, I know. it made me feel better because at least I wasn't crazy but it also made me feel bad because it didn't solve my problem so I just um like the only thing I could manage mentally was to do a bunch of little projects so I started um volunteering at local repair cafe and I started interacting with people, you know, and kind of teaching mending. Um, and then I was watching a video about a social enterprise in London called Bright Sparks. And they were repairing and reusing electrical appliances to keep them out of landfill. And I watched the video and I got goosebumps. And I thought, that's amazing. Someone should do that. And then there was no one who was going to do that. And there was me with all this time on my hands trying to figure out what to do. But I thought, I am totally not qualified to start a business. Like, that is not a thing. Um, and then I was at a party and someone saw me being pathetic and sad about my life and said, did you know there's a program that's free and they will teach you how to start a social enterprise and how to create a business plan? And it's like school for social enterprises. And I went, oh no. And I had that feeling that I've had a couple times in my life when like, you know, 
you have to do something. You don't even necessarily want to do it, but you know your life is going to change and you feel like you might vomit. I don't know. Am I the only person who ever gets that where you're like something big is about to happen and I can't control it anymore? Like, you know, the horse is already past the gate. Um, yeah, so I went to uh, London and I visited the original Bright Sparks and then I started Bright Sparks Australia. And it ended up taking up more than five years of my life. I can't even remember, but we ran a pilot um, in 2015 and 2016. And it was, um, I can't unsee what I saw all the things that people donated and everything that I learned about waste. And, and I've been mending since I was a kid. I've been sewing since I was a kid, but it wasn't until I ran bright sparks that I started to go down the environmental rabbit hole. That's when I really started to think about sustainability and the environment. Um, and just seeing the sheer um, wastefulness and, and the thing that I really, really got from that, and I've written a whole article about it. If you, if you would like to read it, I'll put the link in the chat, but it's, um, I wrote a story called Lessons from Bright Sparks that goes into detail about it. But the main thing that I learned is that um, when you are donating something to an op shop or a charity shop, as you would say, or a thrift store, depending on where you're listening from, um, you only see what you're donating. You don't see what everyone else is donating. And when you start to see the multiples behind the curtain, you go, holy cow, there is so much and you know one person might donate a toaster and they might donate a sandwich press and then you see like the millions of toasters and sandwich presses that that nobody wants and aren't going to have a home and and it really got me thinking like um we really need to push the repair side of things more than recycling and i met someone around that time who told me that recycling is just alleviating people's guilt and that, that freaked me out. And I was like, oh my God, you're right. Like it totally is. And so it really made me want to really push the repair side of things. But also I knew that electrical appliances are not possible for most people to repair. It's, it's like really, not only is it dangerous, but it also takes like, you know, heaps of time to learn. There's safety issues. Whereas clothes mending, anybody can do it. My eight year old nephew could do it, you know, like as long as you give someone the skills and the tools and materials, like it's it's really entry level. And so that kind of started this thing for me of going, well, I can't save all the e-waste from landfill. This problem is way too big. I cannot solve this problem, but I can inspire people and do this little tiny thing that I'm good at, like mending clothes and see where that takes me. And the more I started to do it, the more the people started to react on Instagram and Facebook and go, this is, you know, this is fantastic. And I started to, um, it encouraged me and I started to do more and more. And so now it's at the point where I can't mend something unless I've taken a beautiful before photograph in daylight on a white background, because otherwise it's not a teaching opportunity. And my husband says to me, he's like, Aaron, if you, if you don't photograph that, are people going to learn how many people are going to be impacted by you actually doing it the proper way? You know what you have to do, Aaron. So I'm like <laughs> Frodo and it's like my, you know, ring and I have to anyway. There's um, Nikki actually came and did a, um, one of the open mic slots. I think it was yesterday uh, talking, she works in a charity shop and just saying exactly this about that, that sheer overwhelming volume of donations and how actually do you know, I think I, I've written about this in my book as well, that, that I think there is a tendency for us to use it as this, this sort of panacea for our own overconsumption and assume, you know, it's okay to just keep carrying on consuming like this because we're donating it to charity and that's fine. Um, you know, whereas actually what we need to do is, um, like I really geek out over the waste hierarchy and it's, you know, and, and it's got um, sort of re reduce and reuse and repair and all these things before it's got recycled. So, um, yeah, absolutely brilliant point. Guys, I'm sure loads of you have got questions for Erin. So do pop them. Um, there's an ask a question box at the bottom. Remember, she wants weird questions and she wants hard questions. I'm assuming related to mending and not just like general weird life stuff, but you know. Um, That's fine too. <laughs> is that a I have no filter tonight. It's 8 p.m. in Australia. It's fine. Is that a tease made behind you? Mm-hmm. So I first found out about the teas made when I visited Bright Sparks in London. 
Because I love to eat. It's one of the reasons that I make more sense in Australia than I ever did in America. <laughs> and, and when I found out about it, I was like, is this a real thing? And I helped repair one when I was there. I found all the missing parts and reassembled it. And then I went on this hunt to try to find one, got one. And then actually um, there was like a washer or something that was that had completely degraded. So I found the parts and I fixed it myself and got it up working. We don't actually use it because it's quite noisy. So you have to really, like, you can't, it really goes <laughs> for like a couple minutes, but it's beautiful. My mom and dad had one, my mom and dad had one in the ocean. I'm really echoing, I don't know saying that. Um, and it just seems a weird thing to, to like, because yes, the idea is that when you wake up, you have a cup of tea, but presumably it's woken you up in the process of making the cup of tea because it's so bloody noisy. But, um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Daniela said, can we see some interesting men's? Have you got anything to hand that you can show us? I bet you have. And, uh, no. Um, I would have to go into another room, and I knew this was going to happen. <laughs> I, I have some in my book uh, that I could show you. No, um, show everyone. My favorite picture in the book is, is the cat's arm. Um, oh, I knew. Yeah. That's my favorite picture too. And a lot of people are like, I'm up to page 35 and this is so great. And I'm like, I'm sorry, it's all downhill from there. <laughs> There's a, let's see, can you see? Oh, I don't know if it'll focus. Let me see if it'll focus on that. Um, that's basically a picture of Erin's cat and it is your own cat, isn't it? And Erin's demonstrating yeah. the length of, of um, thread you should use. And it's from your, your finger to your elbow, isn't it? Of um, when you're Correct. when you're darning and her cat demo. How long did it take to get that picture? Uh, it took two tries. We had to be very quick and very uh, like we had to have a plan. So I had to. I, do you really want to know how I got it? Or would you rather have it be magic <laughs> and not know? Um, oh, I'm going to have to get us both up again now. Hold on. Unfocus screen. Hey, that's better. Um, so yeah, and. Um, yeah, I don't, but let's have a look and see if we've got, we've got some questions in here. Um, talk to us a little bit first before we dive into that about modern mending, what that means, um, your interpretation on mending, because you do, some people might not have heard of visible mending, and you do very gorgeous, beautiful visible mending. So talk to us about that. I also do invisible mending. I actually have an invisibly mended I don't know about on right now, but you can't see it, so, okay. <laughs> I want the visible um, well, that's the thing. So, okay, visible mending is pretty much what it sounds like. Um, but it's not just that you did a crap job and it happens to be visible. Is it's it more like about, <laughs> it's, well, it's more about the intention behind it. Like you're you're trying to celebrate it or do it a little more creative or colorfully and going, you know what, uh, this is not going to be invisible. So we're just going to try aim for something else. You know, it doesn't necessarily have to look like a mend. Um, a lot of times I mend things and they, I'm, I'm aiming for better than new. So a lot of times they look intentional and people assume that they were bought that way, which kind of doesn't really, <laughs> and from an activist perspective, it doesn't necessarily help. Um, You've done it too well, also, <laughs> like me. <laughs> but I also do invisible mending for myself. Um, so when it comes to boobs and armpits and crotches, mm -hmm. invisible, like it doesn't, you know, it's personal preference, but that's just for me. So, um, so I think modern mending is two things. I think it's contemporary mending. So that includes visible mending. Um, so, you know, but contemporary in style, not necessarily looking like something that your grandmother might've done or like whatever you imagine, um, like Nana's or I'm imagining like a quilt convention, which there are lots of, lovely things there and I love them sometimes but there's also like a certain aesthetic that's very different to you know everyone has a different aesthetic so it's just something that's more contemporary a little the colors are a little bit different it might be more geometric it might be more intentional um it's just got a different vibe um and then the other part of it is all the mending books that existed before like all the vintage ones they don't have the clothes that we wear now so they don't have jeans they don't have t-shirts they don't have you know, the kids' onesies and things. They don't have these thin machine knit um, cashmere jumpers or sweaters, you know. And so those are the things that people bring to my classes and they say, can you help me fix this? So it's it's about that as well, going instead of, you know, assuming that 
we're all wearing um, handmade, hand dyed linen dresses. You know, we're not. We're we're wearing stuff that comes from the high street, or it's secondhand, or it's whatever. But it's um, it's important too. And I think even fast fashion is worth mending. You know, I get some fast fashion from clothing swaps. I didn't buy it myself, but my friends have got it. And so, you know, I take it on and I still mend it. Like I don't, I don't just toss it. But it's from the charity. (laughs) Well, see, that's the thing. Like, so, but it's fine. Like, so you don't just go, well, I'm not going to mend it because, you know, it's fast fashion. Like I I don't, I think everything is worth mending. Mm. Even underwear. Even underwear. Mm-hmm. We had, we did a, um, a mend along last night if people want to catch the replay. And um, Eleanor did a lovely um, darn for us. And um, Sarah was doing an invisible mend on a crotch. Um, but so a question was asked there about like underwired bras and you know the the, the wire poking out and stuff. So there's mm-hmm. a, a, good, um, a good thing on there on that. Right. What do you think? Stella asks, what do you think about the Japanese tradition of visible mending? So sashiko and boro and all that malarkey oh we could go down the whole rabbit hole with that one um i love sashiko and i love boro but i also um i think what we see of those traditions is not necessarily what they are i think um like if you asked someone in japan today what do you think of sashiko and what do you think of boro they might not even know about them you know um and a lot of the most beautiful mending traditions have come about as part of necessity, you know? And um, like I was, there's this amazing book about Boro that I've got. It's su- it's such a beautiful um, artistic book, but as well as like the history of it. And it says, you know, a lot of the reason that they made the clothes they did out of like hemp is because they didn't actually have wool or cotton in the area where they were. And it was so cold, you know, and they didn't have access to other materials. So so the reason that it was originally created was more out of necessity. And a lot of people were almost like embarrassed or ashamed about it. And now we look at it and go, well, isn't that beautiful? But that's not necessarily what people in Japan today would think or or maybe like 10 years ago or 20 years ago. And I do think those things are beautiful, but I also am reluctant to call um, a lot of mending I see being called Sashko or Boro, where I don't think it necessarily is. I think it's inspired by those things. And I think that's wonderful to have inspiration to give us ideas, but to um, what a lot of people call that now, I don't know that it necessarily is. Just just quickly explain to people who might not have heard those terms before what they are, because people might be thinking like she's talking another language. Yeah, so Boro, B-O-R-O means rags. As far as I know, I mean, I don't actually speak Japanese, but this is my understanding that it means rags. So literally like that's what it was. They were just, it was just patchwork and you would just patch layer upon layer upon layer and then stitch them together. And it just happened that a lot of the fabrics were dyed with indigo um, and they were quite beautiful. So they would they would um, patch like futons and like coats and things. Um, and because they didn't have like the wool or the really thick filling for the winter garments, they would just be like maybe like eight or 20 layers of the same hemp fibers. And it just, it looks amazing. Like it's really, really stunning, but it did wear away over time because those are compostable fibers, you know? So it's, so it has a beautiful effect when we look at it now, but at the time they weren't necessarily mm. trying to achieve that. And um, Sashko is a form of embroidery that is based on running stitch. So if you if you aren't familiar with running stitch, I'm just gonna draw with my finger. It's the one that looks like this. Beep, 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 <laughs> like a dotted line, you know? Um, so it's used to make, I mean, it could just be as simple as the, the dotted line, the running stitch, or it could be multiple rows of running stitch, or it could be um, perpendicular rows of running stitch. So they make little cross shapes or there's all kinds of beautiful geometric patterns that they had, you know, Um, and they would use those to like reinforce fabrics. So the two kind of, they kind of went together. But having said all that, I am not an expert. Like, I don't, you know, I love those things and I appreciate them and I love um, Japanese handwork so much and the attention to detail. Like I just, and I've been to Japan once and it was like the greatest trip of my life. I love it, but Surely um, that was pretty good. That was that was pretty good. But no, I had a, I had my picture drawn by someone in Japan, and I was looking at it the other day, and I was thinking, 
I'm pretty sure that was the happiest day of my life. <laughs> so, so I would I would love to go back there one day when the world is normal-ish. But um, yeah, so I do I do love um, I love all the the older traditions, and I also love all the new inspiration that's coming out of them. Um, and I also see like, cause I teach a mending course and um, it's usually seven weeks, but in, I'm teaching it online right now and we've shortened it to six weeks. And I always find that my students do things that I never would have expected. And they come up with new and interesting ways to do things. And I find that just as inspiring as I do, you know, older traditions and um, styles. It's like, whoa, how did, and I always say like, how did you learn how to do that? And they say, well, you told us to just, you know, make do with whatever we had. And I'm like, wow, I never would have thought of that ever. So amazing. And um, Danielle's asked in the in the questions about, um, is it the most, well, this is my question, is what's the most common mend you get asked about? Because I'm guessing this one might be one of them. So don't Crash you- holes and jeans. Yes. Number one, mm. number one. And everyone thinks they're the only one with that problem. It's everyone. Uh, number two would be my jumper sweater has been attacked by moths. There's a million holes. Can I save this? Um, you. Yes. Yes, you can. But how much time you want to spend saving it is a different thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so Daniel's talking about the crotch one. Um, hmm. Well, there is, I've put a link in there to the mend along because Sarah was demonstrating that um, last night if you want to have a look. But Erin, do you have any... I don't know, secret top tips or, you know, do you hand sew or do you machine sew or um, what are your top crotch mending tips? Uh, I put 22 pages on that in the book. Um, machine darning is number one. And I know not everyone has a sewing machine. So everything else in my book is stuff that you can do by hand. But, that, but machine darning is the most invisible mend. And it's the strongest and most durable. So if you've, if you've got a sewing machine, definitely machine darning. Um, and I had six people read that chapter because I was so intent on getting it right. And there's like safety warnings and everything. So um, there are a couple of tutorials on the internet. If you are interested in what machine learning looks like, there is um, an Instagram account called Indigo Proof. And I can't remember if she's got like an underscore in between or not, but she she's like a sorcerer of some kind. And it totally looks like she has faked her photos and she swapped the before and afters. And then she's like, just like taken a before photo of new jeans and then like blown them up with dynamite. And then like said, that was the before photo that that's what I think she's doing, but she's, you know, I don't know. So she doesn't give you any secrets. She doesn't tell you how she does it, but it's just kind of neat to see what's possible that you can actually do like a truly invisible mend that way. Yeah. And, uh, Oh, this really, this really annoying. Sorry, guys. Um, Diane says, is there anything you can turn jeans into when you've worn through the material due, due to the chunky thigh rub? Dieting hasn't solved the problem. And, and I guess there is that option for the, the invisible mend on the um, on the thighs. And also, Alessia did her upcycling chat earlier on in the week, and she, you know, made bags and all kinds of things from jeans. Do you like upcycling with denim? Um, the, yes, in theory. But I also have so many denim scraps from old jeans. I feel like because I used to, I mean, now I sew maybe one dress a year, maybe. Sometimes I don't even get to that. But for years, I was sewing much more. And I feel like the scraps never disappear. Even when I make stuff out of scraps, then I just make tinier scraps. And it just like never ends. And so, um, so I have a massive mountain of denim scraps. So I try not to just cut up jeans unless they're like really, really bad or my husband refuses to wear them anymore or whatever it is, just because I know it's just the mountain's just going to get bigger. But yes, definitely if they're too far gone, you can cut them up and use them as patches for other things. Um, especially with like stretchy, skinny jeans, you don't want to, you want to make sure that the patch you're putting on there is actually similar to the type of denim that you're mending. So it's kind of nice to have cut up stretchy jeans so that in case you do need to mend another pair you've got something that's similar it's nice to have a couple different styles of denim yeah and um 
Vicky, who did a session, she did the beeswax wrap session. She's made the most amazing denim um, patchwork quilt, like bedspread thing. Um, mm. Go and check out her blog, which is, I think, Vicky Myers Creations. Um, and that is absolutely gorgeous. There's a question on um, the question box, funny enough, about um, speed weave. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that sounds evil. It probably is an evil cackle. Um, so for those of you who don't know, I run a Facebook group called Modern Mending Club. And yes, and we've uh there is we've had so many posts recently about the good old speed weave that I actually created a group document that was like, this is everything you need to know about the speed weave, so that we didn't keep having more posts with people asking about it. Um for those who don't know, the speed weave is a vintage darning loom made in many countries. In earliest one I know about was in the 1930s, I think originally a Danish invention, but it was the term speed weave is the popular name um, made in Lancashire. Is that how you pronounce it? Yeah, well done. Yeah. Uh, and there were like, it was made in many other countries and there's slightly different versions, but it's like a little, it's a little loom that you can use. It's supposed to speed up your darning by like 50 times, but that's rubbish. It doesn't at all. It's, it's just like um, a lazier form of darning. So it's like a loom and the cool thing that it does is it's got all these little hooks that you set up your darning on and you can switch the hooks really easily back and forth. So you don't have to spend as much time weaving over and under. You can just like pass through like a shuttle, like if you were weaving like on a giant loom. Um, so it's kind of like a brainless activity. You don't have to think as hard and you don't have to like use swear words. Um, maybe I'm the only person who swears when they're darning, but sometimes it gets really tricky in there and you're like, where am I? I can't see what I'm doing. I'm over this. So, but it, but it doesn't save time. That's total, that's a lie. <laughs> so it's all over Instagram and Pinterest and everyone wants one because they see everyone else using one and you can make like plaid with it and stuff, but like don't, it is, I didn't put it in my book specifically because I did not want people lusting after something that was going to be super hard for them to find that is not going to actually make their life easier. You get like <laughs> most of the mending that you need to do can be done with stuff you already have in your house. Yeah. Um, you did, and I might see, I might put you on the spot and see if you can remember them, but you did a, a video that you shared on Twitter, wasn't it? That was like mm. 10, 10 things or 15 things you've already got at home that you can use for mending. How many mm. do you remember now to share with us? Oh, let's see. Uh, an orange or a mandarin for darning. So you can use a lemon or a lime. Yeah, so, some, so instead of a darning mushroom, you can use citrus. Although I just did a lecture for some fashion design students and apparently they learn darning on potatoes. So what you, you don't want a tennis ball I've heard disaster stories where the fuzz gets stuck, but you want something that's kind of like hard and that is going to replicate the shape of your toes or heels just for socks. You don't, you don't actually need a darning mushroom or anything if you're going to darn um, a jumper, sweater, whatever. Um, one of my students, this is one of those things where they shocked me. One of my students used tea bag strings to darn a tea towel. And I know tea bags are a little bit controversial these days, but sometimes we have them because sometimes we have guests who come over and will only drink tea out of tea bags. So if you have those, then you can just store them up. And she, the hole that she darned in the tea towel, she used six tea bag strings. So three back and forth going up and then three in the opposite direction. It was beautiful. It was a beautiful darn. So you'd be surprised. Even kitchen string, you can use it, you know. Um, human hair, that was another one. You can use your hair for darning. The silver ones are invisible. So if you're lucky like me to have all these crazy streaks, you can just block them out if you get stuck. Um, you can use your fingers to do finger pressing of fabric. So I'm just gonna use my scarf as a demo here, but um, if you just kind of hold the edges really firmly for a couple of seconds, the heat from your fingers will actually press it almost as good as an iron. Not perfect, but enough sometimes that you can get away with it. Um, I know a lot of my students don't have clothes irons. And and also right now, if you don't have one, we're not in the kind of situation where you can just like borrow from your neighbor, you know? So um, so that's one option. And then um, I make patches out of underpants. So boxers and the stretchy kind. I have even done, my most famous mending commission was mended with my underpants. And at first I was embarrassed to tell 
her and now it's in the book so everyone knows and whatever that's just you know use the good bits not the bad bits the bad bits go in the compost okay yes um chopsticks i use chopsticks when i am ironing the edges of patches to get them smooth and so i don't burn my fingers with the iron also important to know i learned this uh that the steam from an iron can burn you worse than touching the iron so a lot of people think they're safe because they're not actually touching it, but just turn the steam setting off if you're going to iron a patch or a hem or get really close to somewhere. Um, soap. Uh, you can use soap to coat your thread. I normally use beeswax. I don't use it all the time, but I use it when I'm hand sewing. Um, and if you don't have beeswax, you can use a bar of soap or candle wax. You can also use, I didn't say this in the video, but you can use soap to fix zippers. It's one of the few tricks that I have for fixing zippers. You can you can do this thing that I call the soapy jiggle, where if you've got a, I didn't have a better name for it and there wasn't a name, so I made it up. I was going delirious when I wrote my book, honestly. And I was like, nobody's stopping me. So I'm just gonna put a cat paw in here and I'm just gonna name things, whatever I want. And then wait, it's done. Um, but yeah, if your zipper is stuck, you can rub a bar of soap on the teeth and then you can just kind of like try to jiggle like a tiny, like a millimeter at a time, you know, the, the slider and then do some more soap and then do a little more jiggling until you finally get there. That's the soapy jiggle. Um, and I know there was other stuff, but I can't remember. How many was that? How many did oh, I remember? And um, Sue's put matches and safety pins, which I know you mentioned. <sighs> yes. Yeah. Safety pins are my favorite. Um, I, I did do some Sashko stitching on jeans uh, and I didn't open up the side seam. So I was having to stick my hand inside the jeans and, and stitch and, and, and I was getting bloody fingers from the fabric pins. So if you use safety pins when you're doing a lot of hand stitching, you're not going to poke yourself. But I do also use them to mark clothes wherever there are holes so that you can see them because I, I don't know if anyone else has experienced this, but then when you go to actually fix something and you're like, I know there was a hole here, where is it? And then you waste all this time and you have to like hold it up to the light and it's just, it, yeah. So as soon as I find a hole, I just stick a safety pin on it. And then sometimes like, okay, so this example, of this, this uh, jumper that's on the cover of my book, I, it's black. So you can't even see the holes unless you really search for them, you know? So I put a safety pin in each of these spots and then thought, okay, well, how many holes do I have? How many colors can I use? And that helped me plan out the whole thing before I actually started. And um, that picture on the front of the book, that's needle felt, isn't it? I was going to ask you about that as right. well. I've had a few goes, but I feel like I just end up putting more holes in the thing. Like, am I using too big a needle or am I stabbing too hard? Or like, what's all that about? Um, I've only put extra holes in, I, so I tried once to needle felt without adding wool. So I tried to just like get the hole to stick back together and like tried to felt it. And then I actually created more holes. That was, that was a bet, failed experiment. Um, I don't know, maybe we could have a little private lesson <laughs> later and we, we could talk about that. That's yeah. Usually it shouldn't create more holes. Maybe just go bigger than you think you need to go. Because also um, when you're needle felting, the so anyone who doesn't know what needle felting is, it's magic wizardry uh, where you take like fairy floss or cotton candy or whatever you call it. You call it fairy floss in the UK? Wool waving probably. It looks like candy floss, yeah, but it's like. Yeah, yeah. candy floss. Okay, I knew there was another name. Um, so, and it. And then you poke it with this needle that has like notches cut into it and it shrinks down and makes like this flat felted patch, but it shrinks down and it also shrinks in when you do it. And so sometimes if you don't put enough wool in and you keep shrinking it in, then you can end up missing the hole or the hole can reopen like on the side. So sometimes that happens too. And you just have to keep adding like layers and packing it in. Probably my usual thing is not being patient enough, I would imagine, and not kind of taking enough time <laughs> to, to do something. I don't know. It's a bit it's a bit exciting needle felting and people kind of lose their minds. So it's not like I'm, I'm, at, I'm teaching needle felting in my online course next week. And um, normally I have 10 people in my course. This time we've got 22 and I got a student teacher. So one of my original students, I said, can you come help me 
facilitate this class. And I said to her at the end of the last session, when everyone had left the room, I said, get ready because this is going to be so much fun. It's like watching drunk people whenever we teach needle felting because they're like so ridiculously happy and screaming and they're like, oh my God. And it's totally like watching a party full of drunk people. It's the best. <laughs> Um, there's a question about zips, uh, and, I'm mm -hmm. gonna, um, mm -hmm. and actually my, zip, to go. my zip is doing this on my um, coat as well. Benisa said um, zippers on like waterproofs that suddenly start opening from the bottom. And I, I'm assuming I'm going to have to replace mm -hmm. the zip or get someone better than me at sewing to replace it. But do you have any, you know, but they just sort of split from the bottom and... Yeah, there are a lot of different types of zippers. So it actually gets kind of technical and it kind of depends on exactly the style of zip zipper. But if if it's got um if it's like a two-way zip or it's not a two-way zip and the I think the technical term is the box on the bottom, but it's like a jacket zipper. And if that has damaged, that particular type of zipper has to be completely replaced because you can't really get a replacement part. But having said that. I haven't seen that exact zipper, but I do have a thing in my book, um, a two pages on it where I kind of go, if this has happened and it's this type of zipper, then you either repair or you replace. So I kind of go through the different styles, but there are a few, um, if you just Google online, I can't think of the names right now, but there's a, few, there's a few different zipper companies. And I think I fix it as well has a few zipper tutorials where they've, they've kind of got something similar where you can, you can look and match it up to the style of zipper you have and they can guide you through it. Cool. I'm just getting the link. Um, and it's just actually occurred to me that my coat is Patagonia and um, they do a repair service, don't they? So I might, I might get in touch with them and see if they'll, um, but I really want to put a different color zip in because it's a black coat, but I want to now put like a green zip in or something to make it look a bit, um, funkier. Lisa's asked the question, at what point do you give up? And I'm going to say, I don't think Erin does give up because the t-shirt that you talked about, the, the um, I can't remember what you call it, something Marge, isn't it? Um, Large Marge. Yeah. Large Marge, that was your, your most famous mending project. I don't know if you've got a picture of it in the book, you can show people, but like anyone else would have given up on that. Like anyone else would have gone, I'm oh, really yeah. sorry, it's too far gone. But Erin, like how long did it take you? You were like mental. Mind you, it has, you know, you are now famous because of it. So this is Marge. You'll find some better pictures online, guys, if you can't quite see it, but like yeah. Yeah, everything. Um, <laughs> it was, and the, the before picture is just like. It's wow. terrible. I know. Uh, yeah. My husband said, why are you taking that commission? That's rags. <laughs> he wasn't the only one. I had people DMing me on Instagram who said, why did you take that? <laughs> That's rags. I know. And I, and I thought the same thing, but I, you know, I like a challenge and I did think maybe I will learn something from this and then I can share it with everyone and it can become a teaching moment. I, that's, you know, I don't know, but it took forever. It really did take forever, but I did it. Um, there is one thing that I have given up on. I bought a tea towel when I was on holiday many years ago and I was in New York and there was a flea market and it was a beautiful vintage tea towel. And I tried to mend it a few times and it's just fallen apart. Like the fibers aren't strong enough to hold together. So you can't really patch it. And even if I like darned it, it's still not. So I think I'm just going to put it in the compost. So, you know, cause it's made of cotton or linen or whatever it is, but sometimes, sometimes the fibers just get so broken down that you can't really do anything about them. And then that's really all you can do is cut them up and do that. So it's another reason, I guess, why natural fibers are so good and preferred if you have to buy something new. Yes, they do break down quicker and they need to be mended more quickly, but also they're not going to be on the planet for a billion years and you don't have to have that on your conscience, you know? So it's like, okay, well, if it does break down and I can't repair it, I'll just cut it up and put it in the garden. Um, now, this is a question that I got asked last week somebody was doing a like a blog piece about the festival um very kindly sharing it and they said and and you know went through all the usual questions and uh, and i was sort of tapping out the answers quite happily and got to the end one and it was and it said what is the question you wish people would ask you and i was like oh god i can't i can't just put one thing for that but like so what is the one question you wish people would ask you there's so many questions i wish people <laughs> yeah, would yeah, ask yeah. Me. 
I know. I only get one. Um, that's, yeah, I don't know. Uh, I think um, that I know one question I wish they wouldn't ask oh, me. Oh, go on then. Um, that's cheating. Sorry. Uh, so I was recently on television in Australia and the first thing that they had that they edited to come out of my mouth was I mend other people's clothes for money on commission. So I had all these people email me recently who wanted me to mend their clothes, but they all wanted invisible mending. And I just like, I find it fascinating the number of people who have this perception that like, there is, the, I think the invisible mending is a myth, you know? And sometimes, sometimes it can be done by very skilled people, but now it's incredibly rare. And I think some of the things that happen to people's clothes, they have this idea of, it's either going to be completely imperceptible or I'm not going to wear it and I'm going to throw it into landfill. And that just like, and I know that more people want to mend and they're, the rise of visible mending encourages me and gives me hope because I know people aren't so worried about that, but it just, it bothers me still that there are so many people who, who are like, there was, there was one person in particular who said that she had sat on a nail and she had tried to take, the garment to someone else to mend. And she said, I don't know what I was expecting, but she just did it kind of like an old school way and it didn't look very good. But she didn't have an idea of like what she wanted. She just wanted the problem to like magically go away, you know? And I think that, um, I think when people buy clothes now, they aren't necessarily thinking about what's going to happen to that garment in five years, in 10 years, in 20 years, you know, you don't, you're not thinking about, well, what, what if it does rip or, you know, a button falls off or whatever, like, am I going to be able to fix that? Or kind of like, what am I going to be happy with? And so I guess, um, I'm totally not answering your question, but, um, <laughs> but, that, but that, that's the thing that I think about all the time is like, how do we, how do we get, people not thinking that the only way that it's okay for something to be mended is to magically be restored in a time machine and go back to like original mint condition. How do we change that? Yeah, and I think some of the did higher up in the chat as well about, you know, um, invisible mending, like really love visible mending, but actually, you know, if we're going into the office or um, then, then sometimes it doesn't feel like visible mending maybe is appropriate or that we've got and and when, maybe that's something we've got to challenge like I know my husband's like not that keen on me visibly mending his his jeans yeah. you know? um he's a bit more like mm, about it and and I'm sure the kids probably will be when they get older and um like he had a pair of, of really lovely quite expensive trousers and I don't know if it was like the dog jumping up or something and they got this hole in them and I said that there's no way I can do that you know anywhere near approaching invisibly and actually we sent it off. There's a, a company over here called The Clothes Doctor and, and you can send it off to them and they have a little um, team of seamstresses in Cornwall and they, you know, they give you a quote mm. and, that. and they did it, but it wasn't invisible. But, and he's kind of, I don't know if he's now relegated them to kind of not his posh trousers, but I kind of like, you know, part of, I guess, of, of the visible mending is, is, is um, starting these conversations around clothes and repair and also kind of normalizing it. Like it's okay to wear something that's, even if you're at work and you're like, you know, super CEO exec position, which my husband isn't, but do you know, like, should mm -hmm. we, why, why is it a problem that we've got visibly mended clothes in a work environment? It's really weird, isn't it? Yeah, and I even had that issue like many years ago, I had a cardigan that I wore to work, a navy blue cardigan. And it had a hole in it and I was going to try to do it invisibly. And then someone said to me, no, why would you do that? You're the mending lady. And I'm like, yeah, but it's for work. And then they're like, but you're the mending lady. And I went, holy cow, like if I can't even do that, you know, and the same thing, like I, I recovered my couch. We bought a secondhand couch that had like, um, it was bleached by the sun because it had been sitting in a window and I recovered it. And I was, um, originally tried to do it as a slip cover not staple it to the couch and and it was proving really difficult and one of my friends said to me well why don't you just you know make it permanent and I'm like well what happens if I stain it or you know something happens to it and it rips and they're like 
you're the mending lady, just patch it. And I'm like, oh God, like, why didn't I even, you know, so it's, so it's even taken me, even though I do these things to go, yeah, no, actually that's okay. Like we can, we just need to be more comfortable with that and realize that it can look good. It's not super embarrassing. People aren't going to stop being our friend because we have mended clothes. Work clothes, I uh, I totally understand. I'm not saying go ahead and put like rainbows on your work clothes. Like, especially if you sit on a nail, I get it. You know, there are ways to do things more invisibly, but I guess I just, um, the thing that I really want people to think about, and I'm sure everyone who's in this room right now is thinking about this already. So I'm like preaching to the converted, but just to think about, um, you know, that uh, when you buy something that you should be responsible for it. That even if something goes totally wrong and it rips and you've got moth holes and you've got stains and you've got whatever, that you are actually just like, you're going to just calm down, take a breath and go, okay, cool. What am I going to do? I am responsible for this thing. Mm. And that doesn't mean offloading it to the op shop and hoping that magic fairies are going to fix the problem or, or taking it. Like, I don't know if you have the same thing that we do with like H and M recycling where like, is that stuff really getting recycled? You know what I mean? Like, and people are like, yeah, just recycle it. It's fine. But it's, you know, it's, it's not. So, so just to, just to be more mindful. And even if you don't know how to mend something or fix it necessarily to go, okay, it's my job to try to find out, to try. All I want you to do is try. I don't want you to magically be able to fix everything. I just want you to try a little bit harder and ask someone, ask the internet, ask my Facebook group. That's the whole point. You can crowdsource answers to your mending questions in there. If you don't even know what something's called, you just post a picture, you know, but just try to make this stuff last a little bit longer. Yeah. And um, um, Anne's doing a talk for the books about um, some circular fashion and how we can, can do that at home. Yeah. So we're going to dive into this more at six. Um, I could honestly, like, and you and I probably have had like three hour Skype calls before, could chat to you all day. Um, yes. Yeah. Where are you going to do your online course again? That's a great question. Um, so a funny thing happened on the way to coronavirus, and I'm now working seven days a week. So uh, everyone in the world has decided that it's time to get mending now. And yeah, most of the time I'm doing orders. So so I'm trying to juggle a part time job and the shop and the course and. The online course surprisingly has been fantastic. It's been, there are some things that we can't do in the online course that we can only do in person, but there are some really fun new things that I've added that we can't do in the in-person course. Like um, one of the cool things, for example, is that the students this time have been sending me before photos and then I get to draw on them on the computer screen. So everyone gets to learn and see them, but, um, but, as you know, learning new stuff, doing all this online stuff, like it takes a lot. There's a lot of prep that goes into it. It's pretty much like learning how to do something all over again. So um, I'm just trying to be really mindful of my time and go, how can I, I haven't actually mended anything this year. I haven't, I literally have not even had time to mend a single thing this year. And there've been all these challenges that I've wanted to do. And um, so I just, so I think I will definitely do it again but it might not be next term. It might not be again till like October. Okay. And um, Anne asked, where can we, I think, uh, you know, the majority probably of our of our viewers are going to be um, in the UK. And I know that there isn't a UK, um, I don't know how publishing deals work. I should do like publisher of the book. So at the moment, do we have to get it? From the Is other- there not? Is there not? Is that coming soon? I'm not allowed to talk about it. You guys aren't going to say anything, right? <clears throat> Next year. Oh, we're going to wait a yeah. So if you don't want to wait, um, can we? That's one of the things because you you very kindly sent me the PDF, and I really really want like because I just I you know I much prefer books, um, and I really really want to get one, but I'm really. I don't know if I'm overreacting about the sort of carbon um, footprint of getting it from Australia. But having said that, Luke did do his great talk about carbon offsetting um, last um, a couple of days ago. And um, so if we want to get it, is it best to come to your shop on your website? So 
So best, uh, yes, I, I do sell it directly in my shop. Right now, it is taking a very long time for things to get to Europe. But that's that's around the world. Any international shipping is like really slow right now. But yes, you can buy it directly from me. Um, that's how I make the most money. But honestly, I'm happy however you get a hold of it. You're not going to offend me if you buy it from somewhere else. If you buy it from me, you can also buy fun mending toys while you're there. So like, you know, other fun stuff. But um, there is a company that I will not name that has free international shipping. They are owned by a much bigger company you might know called Amazon. Um, so it is possible. So if budget is a factor for you, I'm to like, you know, do what you got to do is what I'm trying to say. I'm not going to. Yeah. But those are yeah. those are the two main options if you were not living in Australia. If you were in Australia or New Zealand, definitely support your local bookshop. And then when all this corona crap is over, ask your library to get it in. Because there's a really cool thing in Australia where if you register and you're an author, um, every time someone checks out your book from the library, you get a tiny payment. Oh, so it's really oh yeah. yeah. It's amazing. And I love it. And it's the most equitable way to do it too, because then people who can't afford to buy the book can actually still read it, you know, and more people find out about it. So, so I'm all for supporting your local bookshop or whatever your favorite way to buy it is. But if you can't find it online, that's because it's only printed in Australia right now, but yes, you can get it directly from me. Cool. Oh. Um, Caroline's we're going to have to be really quick because we've got our next session at 12, but Caroline said about like her stitching or she feels her stitching is atrocious and her kids' scout badges are, are embarrassing. Does it does it improve with time, your stitching capabilities? Yes, if you practice at it. Um, some people also really find um, if you draw a line first to follow, that can help. So my favorite is a blue water erasable marker, but you can use chalk. Um, I wouldn't necessarily recommend like normal pencil, but like chalk is pretty good. And there's all kinds of dressmakers pencils. And so you can draw a line with a ruler or, you know, stitch the outline of whatever it is you're doing and then kind of use that to follow. And sometimes that can really help when you're trying to get better and get straighter lines. And also, I think, remember that, like when you're there and you're looking at your stitching, you're like, this is horrendous. But actually, most people are going to see it from like this distance. Like I did a hand sewn patch in like rainbow around um, some of one of the pair of the kids trousers. And I was like, oh, God, this is really awful. My stitches are really inconsistent sizes and things. But actually, from a distance, it just looks like quite a cool rainbow thing. So, you know, that's my excuse for being messy. <laughs> well, there's safety in numbers, too. Like sometimes I will agonize about a couple stitches or like if anyone has ever painted their house before and they're like the first couple strokes and you're like, why did I choose this color? It's a mistake. And then once you actually like color all the walls, then, you know, then you're like, oh, OK, I can handle this. It's the same kind of thing. So I would say don't start unpicking your stitches until you've made a significant amount of them and then look back at it and reassess and go, is it really that bad or am I just like obsessing because I'm in the beginning of it yeah yeah um, we honestly could talk yeah. about this appear over to the and um, we've got a 12 o'clock panel with Charlotte and um Sally talking about kids clothes so um oh it's been so lovely to talk to you and um oh, well, you I'm gonna have to Skype to do the because you can help me with my needle felting woes um I will help you your um your website is way back up in the chat but it's modernmending.com isn't it and your Facebook yeah group is Modern Mending Club and you're on, um, what are you on Instagram now? Are you Erin or are you Modern Mending? I'm both. I'm Erin Lewis Fitzgerald and I'm Modern Mending. Modern Mending is the shop mainly and the book and Erin Lewis Fitzgerald is like whatever I feel like at the time. Cool. Um, you're absolute superstar. I'll let you go and go to bed or whatever it is you're, um, you're going to do now. <laughs> you're going to binge watch 30 Rock. Oh, I've not heard of that one. Oh, very old shows, like reruns. Anyway, oh, okay. that's great. Lovely to see you. Thank you. Take care, Erin. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.